Welcome back, fans of ADHD Science. Russ Barkley here, and today I want to talk very briefly about the concept that ADHD people are hypersensitive. This is the core idea of Dr. Gabor Matei's theory as articulated not only in his 25-year-old book, Scattered Minds, but also in more recent interviews he did several years ago on the Joe Rogan Experience and also on Diary of a CEO. Now, in my last post about Matei's work, which was probably a year ago, I addressed why he was wrong when he said that ADHD is not genetic. And, of course, I went through the evidence from more than 79 studies that it is highly genetic, showing that he was worse than wrong, meaning wrong repeatedly. Here I want to show you why his idea that ADHD people are hypersensitive is also wrong based upon the prevailing science. Now, this is a core idea of his theory. He claims that ADHD arises out of an interaction between the hypersensitivity of the child with ADHD interacting with stressful, conflicted, traumatizing parental behavior and family context. He's very quick to point out that he's not blaming parents, but we'll get into that later because you can't identify parents as being one of the causes of ADHD and then retreat to saying, oh, but I'm not blaming them. Well, yes, you are, but we'll deal with that another time. Here, let's take a look at the evidence for whether ADHD reflects a hypersensitivity. By the way, here we're talking about a heightened sense of distress, of conflict, of things in the environment that the individual might take as stressful. All right, so here, let us let me bring up Google Safari. We're gonna first of all take a look at the psychophysiological evidence from EEG studies, and there are hundreds of them. Indeed, I reviewed this literature with Jim Hastings back in 1978. We knew this to be true. So here's what Google AI shows as the summation of all of that research. Same conclusion we reached in 1978. It says, when comparing EEG activity between individuals with ADHD and control groups, studies consistently show that people with ADHD exhibit increased theta wave activity, slow brain wave activity, and decreased beta wave activity, which is the faster brain waves, in the frontal regions of the brain. <clears throat> Excuse me. Particularly noticeable in what is called the theta-beta ratio. We don't need to worry about that. But Google goes on to say, this indicates a potential pattern of cortical under-arousal in ADHD compared to controls particularly during resting states. So here we see that rather than being hypersensitive, that is more activity in the brain that is processing the environment, people with ADHD are sluggish and slow reactive and have less brain activity. Therefore, this disproves Matei's point. They are not hypersensitive, at least not according to EEGs. What's interesting is in his book, he even talks about this later in the book, but doesn't see the connection to his theory and that it disproves it, but it does. All right, here is a picture of that brain. We're going to look at QEEG findings here, uh, and this is over at the website for the Sachs Center. And this image shows what happens when you average the brain activity and you plot it on this nice colorful map of the head. And here you see the difference quite distinctly that Google was talking about. The normal brain is on the left, the ADHD brain is on the right, the red waves indicate increased slow wave or theta activity in the frontal lobes of the brain. There's no way you can call that hypersensitivity. It's a reduced sensitivity or reactivity. But wait, there is more from psychophysiological science. There's another way to look at brainwave activity, and it's called the evoked response potential. 
You can flash a light at the individual, or you can have clicks or a sound, and you can then record the reaction of the brain electrically off the scalp to that signal. So evoked response potential. Yet another way of looking at sensitivity of the brain to events in the environment. In this case, the lights and the clicks. What do we see? Well, if you look here at this image over here on the right side of my diagram, if you can zoom in on this, you will see that here's the control group on the left in the graph. Here's the ADHD group on the right. What are we seeing? Exactly what we saw on the resting state of the EEG. There is a reduced reaction to stimulation in the environment in the brains of people with ADHD. And it is primarily out about 200 to 300 milliseconds after the stimulus occurs. Where is that in the brain? That's the frontal lobe's contribution to our activation. And what this is saying is that this brain is less reactive to stimuli than is that of a typical individual. By the way, this may also be why stimulants are so helpful for people with ADHD. They do help to activate the brain, not just increase inhibition. Okay, so we see from evoked response potentials that the brains of people with ADHD are not hypersensitive, quite the opposite. All right, we're gonna go over and look at another piece of evidence from psychophysiology. I also reviewed this evidence back in 1978. So all of this was available to Matei when he wrote his book in 1999. So you can't say that, oh, this is later research and he didn't know about this. He simply didn't look for it, but it was out there. Here's what Google has to say using its AI-generated review of what's on the internet. Research suggests that individuals with ADHD often exhibit decreased skin conductance, which is interpreted as a sign of lower overall physiological arousal compared to those without the disorder. Essentially, people with ADHD may show a reduced level of this autonomic nervous system activity of which skinned conductance is indicated to be or, or is an index of the state of that nervous system. So we have an underactive brain, we have an underactive autonomic nervous system reflected in these three psychophysiological markers, EEG, QEEG, evoked response, and now the fourth skin conductance. Finally, let's go over and have a look at a biochemical measure of activation. This is known as salivary cortisol. Cortisol is a chemical that gets secreted into saliva and elsewhere during periods of stress. And what do we find when we compare the cortisol stress responses of people with ADHD to typical people? Let's look at AI from Google again. Research indicates that individuals with ADHD often exhibit lower levels of salivary cortisol compared to those without the disorder, suggesting a potential dysregulation in their stress response as measured by this hormone marker. Essentially, listen up, people with ADHD may show a diminished stress response compared to the general population. So there you have it, folks evidence from various areas of psychophysiology that go all the way back into the 1960s and 70s that I reviewed even in 1978 that reached all of these conclusions that people with ADHD are not only not hypersensitive, they're hyposensitive to their environment and show a decreased stress response. Yet more evidence that Gabor Mate's theory that ADHD is an interaction of hypersensitivity with traumatizing parenting is wrong and repeatedly wrong and therefore is worse than wrong. Thanks for joining me today for more scientific evidence about ADHD. And I hope you'll join me again later this week for other commentaries and my research review. But in the meantime, 
Thanks for following this channel, one of the few channels where science matters and ADHD scientific evidence prevails. Thanks so much. Take care and be well.